joined this afternoon over the telephone by my guest, Dr. Mirvat Matkur, Professor of Political Science. Dr. Mirvat. Hello. Uh, very good afternoon to you, Dr. Mirvat. How are you doing today? How are you doing, Inji? Very well indeed. Thank you very much, Doctor, for joining us uh, on this edition of The World Today. And uh, we'd like to begin with news from the World Bulletin. Headline reading, Egypt CC tells West to keep out of Libya. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah Sisi warned Western powers Libya could spiral out of control if they try to intervene militarily in the conflict-wracked North African state. Speaking in a rare interview, Sisi said the West and its allies should instead concentrate on strengthening the army of Libya's Western-backed government and let it do the job of stabilizing the country. The army in, uh, is commanded by Khalifa Haftar, an official, an official retired general who spent 20 years in exile in the U.S. and has been described as a potential Libyan Sisi because of his peers' opposition to the opposition groups. Sisi said history had spoken clearly about the difficulty of trying to impose peace from the outside. Italy has said it is prepared to lead a UN-backed international peace force into Libya if and when the country proves capable of establishing a national unity government with the authority to ask for outside security help. Now, Dr. Mirvat, how uh, do you see the recent statements by President Abdel Fattah Sisi warning Western powers to not interfere uh, uh, in the Libyan crisis? Well, uh, as uh, President Sisi himself said also to the West, that they have to refrain really from intervening in Libya because you've seen what they have done in Iran. Mm. Is that a stable government? Is that a life or a promise of democracy? No, it's a promise of terrorism, you know, and, and instability. So certainly a country that is uh, just next door to Egypt is a strategical uh, area. And nobody has really to intervene uh, in, in, in in Libya because it will create more chaos than it is already prevailing. Mm. Simultaneously, the West has insisted on not uh, providing the army of Khalifa Haftar, which is actually the remaining of Gaddafi uh, uh, army with uh, with armament. And why, believe it or not, it's a puzzle to me. It's as if the West is somehow conspiring to bring all those that are uh, uh, terrorists that are in, in Syria and Iraq uh, here in our neighborhood. Why? I don't know. The whole thing is now moving to northern Africa. If you look, for example, at uh, in, uh, Morocco and Algier, you will, uh, Algeria, you will see that there is a problem now all of a sudden rising uh, from the Polisario and their fight on the desert. Mm -hmm. So the whole is, uh, northern Africa is now there. Are they going to transfer the whole issue from being in Syria and Iraq to northern Africa? That's it. That's a, that is a question that the West and the United States have to answer. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Dr. Mirvat, let's go uh, on a more economic front uh, to more news from Al-Ahram Online. And the headline reads, Pound devaluation is credit positive for Egypt, and this is a statement by Modi's. Uh, the recent decision by the Central Bank of Egypt to adopt a flexible exchange rate has been remarked as credit positive for Egypt to remain stable at B3, according to Modi's investor services. The U.S.-based leading credit rating firm said the CBE's devaluation of the Egyptian pound brings the official exchange rate closer to market rates and is likely to boost exports and foreign investment flows. On Wednesday, the Egyptian pound was strengthened by 0.07 to reach 8.78 against the U.S. dollar at an exceptional auction held by the Central Bank of Egypt two days after depreciating it by 14.4% against the dollar from the previous rate of 7.73. Uh, the flexible exchange rate, according to Modi's, will help in easing the strains on Egypt's external liquidity position and improve the country's export earnings, which have been suffering from a decline in tourism. Uh, and lower petroleum exports and weaker global demand. Now, do you agree with Modi's uh, 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 statement regarding the flexible exchange rate that the Central Bank of Egypt has adopted? Well, look, 
uh, NG. There are two sides to any uh, decision, okay? If there are pros and cons. But if you look at the Egyptian economy, at the time uh, this uh, new devaluation has taken place, you will know that it is really, you know, it was essential. There was nothing we can do about that. Mm -hmm. But however, this devaluation it must not be alone, you know, or, or just this has to be taken as a measure. There right. are other things that must be done. For Indeed. example, price control. Indeed. Dr. Mirvat, that leads me to my next question. What other measures do you think that the state can put in place in order to boost up the Egyptian economy? You know what, Inji? The problem is that all the products, you know, maize and wheat and uh, petroleum, we know that they have, uh, in the international market, they have decreased in price. Mm -hmm. However, here in Egypt, everything is going up high. Mm. And if you look at the, the world data published by uh, the World Bank, you will know that, for example, wheat has decreased by 14%, which is exactly what happened with the devaluation of the Egyptian pound to the dollar, right. which is 14%. However, we have been buying wheat at the price that was prevailing three or the, two or three years before. Right. So we have greedy traders. We have greedy importers that want only to benefit, even if it is on our courts. So the government has to take harsh measures, really. I know it is hard. I know President Sisi has instructed the, uh, the, the, the military to offer all these goods at reasonable prices, but he cannot cover the whole society. Mind you, we have poverty rate at, at uh, 48 percent, and middle class is also affected with this new decision. Mm -hmm. So really, he has to face them. And they have really to sacrifice their um, enormous profit. It's only in Egypt that you gain 100 and 200 and 300 percent. Everywhere it is specified, Indeed. your marginal profit. Mm -hmm. Not in Egypt. Right. Dr. Mervet, let's move to regional news from the Daily Star Lebanon. And the headline reads, Palestinian stabs Israeli soldier in West Bank and is shot dead. A Palestinian teenager stabbed and wounded an Israeli border guard in the occupied West Bank city of Hebron Saturday before being shot dead. One guard was likely injured in the incident which occurred near a disputed place of worship and, and another border guard killed the 17-year-old assailant. According to the police, the Palestinian approached a checkpoint close to the site, uh, known to Muslims as the Ibrahimi Mosque and to Jews as the Cave of the Patriarchs, where he was asked for identification. He then drew a knife and attacked one guard before being chased and shot dead. Now, the current situation in the occupied East Jerusalem and the West Bank uh, is worsening. There are more violent incidents and uh, harsher retaliations by the Israelis. How do you view these escalations? And do you think, like some analysts say, this is the build-up for a new intifada or an uprising? Well, let me tell you one thing, Inji. You remember, God bless his soul, uh, uh, ex-foreign um, uh, minister of Egypt, Butter Israeli. He said there will be no peace in this region and no Palestinian state will be established for as long as Netanyahu is in power or one similar to him. Okay. There are this, this right wing that is now governing Israel is really, you know, uh, contributing to more violence. Mm. And violence doesn't entail anything else but violence. Mm. Right? So, for as long as this violence is prevailing, how could you establish peace? How would you even think of it? You know? Right. And uh, why can't the whole region live in peace? I just can't really understand sometimes. For as long as you have one as well, like Hamas, who is a tool in the Israelis' hands, and is really inhibiting uh, the, the establishment of a Palestinian state. Mm -hmm.
Do you think, Dr. Mehmet, that the uh, international community and the world powers have uh, sidelined or ignored the Palestinian-Israeli issue and conflict uh, and peace process and peace talks uh, in, uh, because of the other uh, crisis situations in the Middle East and other countries like Syria it and Iraq? It was cursed. Just, you know, it was just put aside because there are so many things happening in the region. You know, it is a real, uh, you know, it's, put a veil, it's putting a veil upon the situation. Mm. Yes. So, uh, really, it has uh, somehow masked it for a while, right. I can say. Indeed. But it will not mask it for, uh, forever. Indeed, indeed. Right, Dr. Mirvat, let's go to the Khalij Times and another headline reading, Syria's war-battered pound hit by Russian withdrawal. Battered by war which has inflicted incalculable damage on industry, infrastructure and economy, Syria's currency hit new lows this week after Russia said it was reducing its military support for President Bashar al-Assad. The Syrian pound has fallen to 475 to the dollar on the black market, a 90% drop since March 18, 2011, when the security forces fired on protesters, sparking an uprising which descended into civil war. Backed by financial and trade support from Iran, Syria's government succeeded in stabilizing the pound early in the conflict, but the slide accelerated as it lost control of territory and border crossings, trade collapsed, and Western sanctions bit. Also, Gulf Arab investments dried up and major cities were devastated and, of course, half the population has been displaced. Uh, the collapse of the currency has driven up inflation and aggravated wartime hardship as Syrians struggle to afford basics such as food and power. And, of course, the government budget spending uh, has more than doubled. Uh, and um, the uh, surprise military intervention turned the tide of the war in Assad's favor, but only briefly stemming the currency's decline. And Moscow's declaration Monday that it was pulling out its forces hit the pound again. Now, the situation in Syria is crumbling, not just on political or humanitarian levels, but also on economic bases. How do you view the recent uh, effect of Russia's withdrawal on the Syrian pound? Look, uh, the Russian withdrawal is just showing uh, the goodwill on part of Putin and uh, Russia in, in general, okay? But this, uh, President Putin has said on his uh, speech uh, that uh, the, the, the Russian troops can return in a in few minutes back to Syria if anything happens. Mm. That means that they have not let down Assad and Assad's regime, and they wanted to really continue at least, at least in the transitional era. In addition, uh, as President uh, uh, Sisi said, it is for, for the Syrians to decide who is going to rule them. Mm -hmm. It's not a decision made in uh, the Gulf area or made by Syria, uh, by uh, Saudi Arabia, or made by, by the United States or anybody else. Right. Okay. So uh, I don't, if it is the Khaliji Times, I, I, I do understand their uh, attack on, uh, on, on Russia. It is quite understood because to them, the Russians are supportive of Assad, which whom they don't want, and, they are uh, and he is a supporter, of course, of Iran. Mm -hmm. It is their ally, and certainly it is the enemy of Saudi Arabia and the Khalij uh, countries. Right. Dr. Mirvat, what are the prospects of reaching, I won't call it a peace deal, but some sort of agreement uh, in order to alleviate uh, the situation for the people, the remainder of the people that are living in Syria who are struggling from food shortages, power cuts, lack of money, lack of schools, lack of health services, a humanitarian crisis on the ground in Syria? Look, I've been always saying that the ones who are paying the receipt for this war are the Syrians themselves. So don't tell me about humanitarian aid and humanitarian stuff. The way the the the, the, the Nostra and I don't know which factions, because I heard the other day that there are 98 factions fighting in Syria. So it is understood this violence, this enormous violence that has taken place. 
Sometimes I wonder what is going on in this region. Since when are, are we standing against each other in such a manner? Whoever is Shiite, let them be Shiite. Whoever is Sunni, let them be Sunni. Whoever is Christian, let them be Christian. No matter what. Religion is a very, very, very private relationship between an individual and his God. And we shouldn't be judges of it. And I really, as, as President Abdel Fattah Sisi was saying the other day, that he cares for the state of Syria, that Syria as a state should remain, and should remain intact and not cut into pieces, as they are planning for it, as they have already done in Iraq, as they are planning for Libya, and planned for Egypt, and so far we have escaped it. Mm -hmm. They are people who are trying to design our future, no matter what are the consequences, even if it costs millions of lives of Arabs, for as long as they do not touch their majesty, they are all right with us. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's move to the New York Times. The headline reads, UN Envoy visits Yemen for talks with rebels. UN Envoy Ismail Wal Sheikh Ahmed arrived in Yemen's rebel-held capital to try to restart peace talks between the Iran-backed insurgents and the internationally recognized government. The Mauritanian diplomat met with Ali Hajar, a foreign affairs representative of the Houthi rebels, at Sana'a Airport director, uh, uh, commented, and it came a day after the UN envoy held talks in Riyadh with the Yemeni president Abdul Rabbu Mansour Hadi. Uh, the Yemeni news agency said that Wil Sheikh Ahmed met Hadi to relaunch efforts to establish peace in Yemen. Yemen has been gripped by violence since September 2014 when the Iran backed Houthi rebels who've long complained of marginalization stormed Sana'a and forced the internationally recognized government to flee south. A Saudi-led coalition began bombing raids on Houthi positions across Yemen in March 2015, but the insurgents still control parts of the country, including the capital. Now, uh, Dr. Mirvat, a senior Houthi official, asked Iranian officials to stay out of Yemen's conflict after an Iranian general said Tehran might send military advisors to help the Houthi forces fight a Gulf Arab coalition. How do you view this? Well, uh, yeah, nobody can deny that uh, the one who has been supporting El Houthis so far has been uh, Iran, as mm -hmm. you know. And definitely training uh, the Houthis or those who are rebellious under uh, uh, Sheikh Abdullah Saleh, the ex-ruler uh, of Yemen or president of Yemen, certainly are now somehow allies against uh, Abdel Hadi, uh, the new president, mm -hmm. who is supported, of course, by Saudi Arabia and Egypt as well. Mm -hmm. We uh, have, um, a, a, you know, committed ourselves to help uh, Saudi Arabia in its um, uh, fight or its war with the Houthis because it is quite understood that their aim was not just to crush Yemen, it was also meant to crush Saudi Arabia or to pull the leg of Saudi Arabia into a war that God knows when it was going to end. Mm -hmm. So let's hope that the new peace talks will really lead to a peace, uh, you know, um, or a ceasefire or actually the recovery of Yemen for as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. The whole area is burning, Angie. Mm -hmm. and should be really latched down. Indeed. Dr. Mirvat, uh, the Saudi Foreign Minister Abdel Jubair, uh, Adel Jubair said his country and other Gulf monarchies could turn a page and build strong relations with Iran if it stops meddling in their affairs and respects them. Uh, how do you read this statement? Well, Adel Jubair, in my opinion, has been, you know, uh, making fiery statements, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's required, and he is young. It's unlike Abdullah uh, Sheikh al Faisal who passed away and was uh, the foreign minister for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Certainly, this is an elderly person who has been very wise, and the situation in the Gulf area was calm anyway. Mm 
Mm-hmm. But now the situation really requires sometimes that you are fearful, and it's quite understood. Right. Dr. Mirvat Matkur, Professor of Political Science and our guest uh, for this afternoon's edition of The World Today. I'd like to thank you very much, ma'am, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, doctor. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we wrap up this edition of The World Today. My name is Angie Mehr. Many thanks for watching.